for doing the lab reviews. This is being recorded on my um, iPad. And what's recording is the audio and then whatever's on the screen. And then after class is over, then I put it on YouTube. So if you want to, um, when you're studying, you can go to YouTube and search for me. My name's Patricia Steinke. And then you can find our review. And then, of course, as you know, you can zoom into any place of the, um, the video that you want to listen to. So you don't have to listen to the whole darn thing again, just the parts that you might find useful. Okay, and so again, that's just another study tool that is provided for you to try and help you do better and utilize your study time a little bit better. Okay, so lab test one. Um, exercise one was the scientific method. Now, you guys found in your notebook the activity on the scientific method. I think at the bottom of the activity or even a question in the activity asked you to list the steps of the scientific method. What are the steps of the scientific method? Your observation. Observation. Hypothesis. Hypothesis. Testing and then conclusion. Those are the four steps of the scientific method. Making observations, then based on your observations, writing a hypothesis, then designing an experiment or a test to test your hypothesis, and then based on the data collected in your experiment, drawing a conclusion. Okay, question two, if given an experimental variable, be able to determine the exper experimental group, control group, experimental variable, and data. Okay, so I thought we'd just look at one of our experiments and practice this. Could you join me on page 30 in your laboratory manual? On page 30 in your laboratory manual, we did an experiment where we tested for the presence or absence of starch. And we had five test tubes. Does everybody see that data in their lab manual? Yes. Okay. I'm going to jump to the second bullet, which is the easiest thing for people. It's the controls. This experiment had a positive control tube and a negative control tube. What was the positive control tube? The starch. The starch. Test tube number two, the starch. What was the negative control tube? The test tube number one, the distilled water. Okay, so why? So positive controls are where you know what you're going to get and it's going to be a positive result. Negative controls are where you know what you're going to get and it's going to be a negative result. But it kind of on controls. What's the two purposes of the control? To validate. Validate and compare. Excellent. Validate. And Amy said compare. It's excellent. But okay, on the controls for that. I'm just using this one as an example. Okay, the experimental group. So three of the tubes were experimental tubes. Which three were the experimental tubes? Onion juice, potato juice, and glucose. Where we didn't know what the answer was, so... You know, we actually had to do the experiment, collect the data to figure it out. So the experimental groups are the ones where you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So control groups, you do know what the outcome should be, and the experimental groups, you don't know what the outcome should be. Okay, the experimental variable is what made one tube different than the next. Okay, look at that table. What made one tube different than all the other tubes? Exactly, Jess is correct. It's the contents. In this example, what made one group different than the next group were the contents. The contents was the variable here. What we change from test tube to test tube is what we put into the test tube, the contents. Okay, again, look at that table. What was our data for this experiment? I'm sorry, I didn't hear anything. The color? Excellent. Jessica's right, the color. 
The color was our data. Remember, data are observations or measurements you take during the experiment. Okay, now just look up here on those four bullets. Are you guys okay on looking at an experiment and figuring out the four things that are listed there? But he's okay. With our handout of the earthworm experiments we did, we practiced writing hypotheses. Uh, a really good hypothesis is written as an if, then, because statement. For example, if an earthworm is put in a dry environment, then it will move to a moist environment because it will easily dry out. That's an if, then, because sentence. Don't forget a hypothesis is a tentative explanation. It tries to tell you what you think is going to happen and explain why you think it's going to happen. Guys, pretty much every day in lab, you have been doing experiments, collecting data, and drawing conclusions. Could you look on page 30 and tell me, what were the conclusions that we drew from our data on page 30? What'd you write? Yes. Yes, that's good. Valeska's right. Either yes, the test tube contained starch, or no, it did not contain starch. Now, how did you come to those conclusions? What did you look at? The data. Conclusions are based on the data. What Wasn't color the data that you collected? You just tell me that. So conclusions are based on... Data, yes? Okay, great. We've been practicing this every day, so I don't, I'm not too worried about this. Everybody feeling okay about the scientific method? Super. All right, our very first day together, we worked on metric measurements. And so I want to talk to you about some um, prefixes first. I'm worried about this part. Well, let's talk about it. Okay, so the standard unit of measurement for length in the metric system is the meter. Do you remember a meter can be divided into centimeters and millimeters on a ruler? So take a look at this. Hold on. Yeah, that's good. I want to know how to fill in these blanks. Let's start with the top blank. Um, first of all, M is meter. CM is centimeter. So how many centimeters are in a meter? 100. Because what does centi mean? 100. Okay, there's a ruler somewhere on your table that you and your lab partner can look at. The lines, the big lines with the numbers on them are the centimeters. I'll pass one over to Ruth Mara because she can't reach that far. There we go. Okay, so great. The next question is, um, now we have a centimeter. You can see it on the, the ruler. How many millimeters are in a centimeter? Ten. And millimeters are the little black lines. Just a quick caution, make sure you always use the metric side of the ruler. Okay, now we can do math. I know you can. So everybody look up here. If it's 100 centimeters per meter and 10 millimeters per centimeter, how many millimeters are there in a meter? Would you multiply those? You would. You would multiply them. Jess is correct. You would multiply them. So 1,000 is the answer. Okay, I don't feel like No, you're good. So,
So guys, I want to talk to you about um, some other units of measurement. Some of you may have noticed these other units of measurement, and if you will, I want to show you some pictures where you may have noticed these other units of measurement. Would you join me in your lab manual on page 14? I know I pointed this picture out to you. For those of you that had your lab manual that day, page 14, were pictures of blood and blood cells with different microscopes. Do you guys see there's a little ruler at the bottom right-hand corner of each of those pictures? That's to show you the scale. Do you see the funny-looking UM that's there? Okay, so that is also a metric unit of, of length because the M stands for meter. What they wanted was a unit they could use to measure things under the microscope, and they, like us, found that millimeters were too big. One day, we put a ruler on the microscope, and we found out that when you go to high power, the field of view was only half of a millimeter. So you couldn't even see the ruler. Y'all remember seeing, remember we couldn't even find the ruler lines when we tried to look at the ruler on high power. Millimeters are just too big. So they took a millimeter and they divided it into 1,000 equal units. And those are called micrometers. But they couldn't use MM for micrometers. How come? It's already been taken. So they used the Greek symbol for micro, and that's that funny-looking U. Yeah, that's the Greek symbol for micro. What does micro mean to you? Small. Small. And so um, we, you're going to notice lots of pictures that come off of um, photos taken from microscopes. You're going to notice, now that I've pointed it out to you, you're going to notice that that's the unit of measurement that's used mostly for things that have been um, viewed using a microscope. Okay, then in the 40s, 1940s, we developed the electron microscope. And the electron microscope allowed us to go to way, way, way higher magnifications. And so the same thing happened. They figured out that the micrometer was too big and they needed another unit. So they came up with this one. NM. Does anybody know what the N stands for? Nano. nano. And what's nano mean to you? Really really, small. really, really small. So they took one micrometer and divided it into a thousand equal units. And that's a nanometer. And nanometers are really, really small. Now, with the electron microscope, we started seeing stuff that we had never seen before that were too small, like we knew they were there, but we couldn't see them, viruses. You guys have heard of viruses. We knew they were there, but we didn't know what they were made of, and we, didn't, we couldn't see them before we developed the electron microscope. Guys, we've even seen atoms with the electron microscope. Now, they're big. The atoms that we've seen are big, like uranium. It's a real big atom. Its molecular weight's like 235. Remember, hydrogen has a mass of 1. So this is a real big atom, but we have been able to see atoms with the electron microscope. Um, you're going to see some measurements with NM. I'm, just to, for a moment, let me show you what I mean. Turn to page 72 real fast in your book. Because I don't want you to think I'm teaching you stuff that won't come up again, that you know, we're not going to use again. Page 72, uh, in a few weeks we're going to be studying photosynthesis. Do you guys see the x-axis there on that graph? Yes. Look at the unit. Nanometers. Nanometers. Which means, like Jess said, really, really small. And so lots of times uh, pictures that come off of the especially transmission electron microscope or in other uses, you're going to see the NM. So I just want to introduce it to you. Okay, so let's finish this last blank up here. It is. It's a thousand times a thousand. So that's really, really small. Really, really small. Yeah. Okay. 
So on question number two, we're supposed to make conversions. Now let's use the things you wrote down in question number one to help us do the conversions for question number two. We need to convert 23 centimeters to millimeters. Go ahead. Excellent. So AJ looked at her notes and she saw that it takes 10 millimeters to make a centimeter. So she just multiplied it by 10 or moved the decimal one time. But okay on that one. Okay, let's try the next one. 368 millimeters, we're supposed to convert it to micrometers. Would that be 3,680? Mm, is that enough? Word. How many zeros do we need to put on this? Three. three. Oh, 368 mm -hmm. You put three zeros on there. Everybody okay on that one? All right, try the last one. We're converting six um, micrometers into blank nanometers. It would be. <coughs> you okay on that one? Okay, super. There's a ruler on your table. We already looked at it. I want you to answer these two questions regarding the ruler on your table. If you have a lab partner, go ahead and consult with them and see what they want to put in those blanks. Wait, what was the question? How many centimeters are on the ruler that's in your hand on your table? And how many millimeters are on the ruler on your table? Joseph, what did you come up with for the number of centimeters? Fifteen. Does everybody agree with Joseph? Yeah. Haley, how many millimeters did you come up with? No, ma'am. It's 152, right? Huh? 150. Yeah, so your ruler may have had exactly 15 centimeters. Your ruler may have had 15.2 centimeters. I'm going with if your ruler had 15 centimeters, then you had 150 millimeters. We do have some variety of the rulers in the room. But it feel okay on looking at a ruler and being able to do that. All right. I need the freezing point of water in Celsius and the boiling. Harder question, not on your review sheet. When does water reach its maximum density? Four. Good. Okay. All right, number five. So you're going to have some skills that you have to do on the test. I've got a seashell in my hand. What if I have to do the mass of the seashell? What instrument do I use? No, the mass. The triple beam balance. Is that you, Gage? The balance, the triple beam balance. I just want to caution you, the only way you can mess this up is if you forget to put the weights in the notches. The back two rows have notches that the weights fall into the notches. Make sure you're putting the weights in the notches when you're moving the weights around. Okay, now I have to do the volume of this seashell. What do I use? Now I use the graduated cylinder. Do I need any water? Do you put the water in before or after the seashell? Before. before. Do you have to know how much? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm making this up. Let's say I put in 15 mils of water. I dropped the seashell in. It went to 22 mils of water. What's the volume? Seven. Seven milliliters. Seven milliliters. What did you do there? Subtraction. Subtraction. Good. Okay. Think hard before you answer. I need to know the mass of this box. What do I use? The length triple beam. Triple beam balance. I knew you'd do it again. Um, mass is triple beam balance. Uh, let me ask you this question. What's the unit for the answer? Grams. Thank you, grams. Okay, now I need to do the volume of this box. What do I do? 
Length times width times height. Using what unit? Centimeters. Because centimeter times centimeter times centimeter is? Centimeters cubed. And that's what I want. Cubic centimeters. Okay, bring a calculator to class on Thursday. It doesn't have to be scientific. This, this little calculator from Walmart will do the job. It adds, divides, subtracts, multiplies, and does square root. We do need a square root button later in the semester. I swear, five bucks at the most. Okay, you probably have one like this or something like it laying around the house. They give them away for free these days. Funny story, my sister graduated from Sam Rayburn High School in 1973. Her graduation present was a calculator. It cost $300 in 1973. She was thrilled. Add, subtract, divide, and multiply. She was going to be an accountant. Uh, well, she has her own business, so yeah, I guess so. Yeah. That's a funny story. Okay. Number six, what is a meniscus? That's the bottom, that's the bottom, bottom part, of the little curve. curve. Okay, so when you put liquid in a graduated mm -hmm. cylinder, you see I did really good artwork up here. The water doesn't go straight across, it dips. And we call that dip the meniscus. How do you properly read a meniscus? Read the bottom of it. Now make sure you get eye level. Make sure you keep the graduated cylinder on the tabletop during the test. Don't pick it up in the air. Why not? Because it won't be level. It won't be level. Keep it on the tabletop and then bend and get eye level to read the meniscus. Okay, on the meniscus of the graduated cylinder. We've been practicing with the graduated cylinder a lot, so I know that you're very accustomed to it. Okay, let's look over metric measurement and see if there was anything there that you had questions on or needed repeated. Great, I want to move ahead to microscopy. So we were already on page 14. You know, guys, let's just say you went to the beach and you collected some seashells on the beach and you came back to this lab and wanted to look at the seashells in more detail. Would you use the compound light microscope? That's the one that's back in that cabinet right there that we've used a few times. Or would you use a stereoscope? A stereoscope. Yeah, let me show you real fast a stereoscope. We've used it before. I, I store them over here. One day we came in and used these to study our earthworms. One day we came in and we just studied all kinds of stuff. We saw some butterfly wings, we saw some flowers, somebody was looking at a peacock feather, a bug, stuff like that. Okay, so are you okay that if you wanted to look at seashells you collected at the beach, you would use stereoscope? Okay, how about if you also collected some sea water at the beach and you wanted to know what were the living things in the sea water, what would you use? Would you use the stereoscope? No. You'd use the compound light microscope. And we would prepare slides of the water, right? With drops of water on the slide. And then we'd add a cover slip. Do you remember what those slides are called? Where you put liquid on the slide and add the cover slip? A wet mount. A wet mount. We would prepare wet mounts. So that's what I mean by the question, know what kinds of things you would use each scope to look at. You know, the stereoscope is kind of like a fancy magnifying glass, and it allows you to see the surfaces of things, whereas the compound light microscope allows you to see through things. Would you ever be able to see through this seashell? No. no. So if you tried to put this on a compound light microscope, you wouldn't see anything because the light can't go through it. Okay, and so guys, that was what I meant for number one. Have a general idea what kind of microscope would be appropriate for viewing various objects. Okay, 
It's okay on that one. This one's called a stereoscope. And then the other is called the compound light microscope. And again, those are our two scopes that we use in, in this lab, stereoscope and compound light microscope. Okay, now we don't use an electron microscope, but we do get to look at pictures of things from the electron microscope. Like on page 14, letter B is from a transmission electron microscope, and letter C is from a scanning electron microscope. So I just wanted you to think about big differences. And the first obvious difference is the source of energy. Uh, light microscopes use light as a source of energy. What about electron microscopes? What do they use as a source of energy? Electrons. How about that? Light microscopes use light as a source of energy, and electron microscopes use electrons as a source of energy. Now, because the electrons never scatter, you get better images. Does light scatter? Yes. <coughs> yeah, just look up. You can see it. Scattering. Bounces around. Electrons don't scatter. They shoot straight. Okay? And because of that, you get sharper, clearer images. And because of that, we get higher magnifications. Check it out, page 15. I don't know if I ever pointed this out to you. Look at that table. You, need, you are not going to memorize this table. I'm just showing it to you. Cameron? Okay, so you said that electrons, they shoot straight, right? So mm -hmm. what happens when they get some? Okay, then they'll veer off. Then they'll bounce off. And on scanning, that's what you're counting on, is them to hit something and bounce back at you. And in transmission, they'll, they go through. And depending upon the density of the, the material, they'll go through um, and make dark spots where it's real dense, and then they'll make light spots where it's not dense. Check out um, number four on the table where it shows you the magnifications. That's a huge difference, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, compound light microscopes can magnify up to 2000X, and that's your very best, like at MD Anderson, okay? And then electron microscopes, specifically a transmission electron microscope, can magnify up to 1 million X. It's crazy. Now, we aren't going to memorize those numbers, but I think the point is made, the benefit of the electron microscope. They're okay on that. So the scanning, scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope are the same thing? Mm -mm. So transmission electron microscopes, you're actually seeing through objects. So uh, like letter B, see how I can see on the inside? Mm -hmm. And scanning electron microscopes, I'm seeing on the outsides. So it depends on what I want to know. Do I want to see the outside of something or I want to see the inside? So that's why I have two different tools. That's a good question, Amy. Okay, I've already done number three. Know how to use a dissecting or stereo microscope. What can you view with it? And you could view things like seashells, coral, I'm trying to think what else. Insect wings. Um, I like to look at flowers, leaves, all kinds of critters. I could look at earthworms, all kinds of things. It's fun. Okay, I have two stars on number four, which means that you're going to have lots of questions on question number four. Question number four are the parts of the compound light microscope. We went through each one. On page 19, I think we even labeled a picture together. Yeah, it was a lot. And then you have to know what each part's for. Like, what is the ocular for? Well, obviously the ocular, also known as the eyepiece, is for you to look through, but it also magnifies. Or the, the adjustments, the coarse adjustment and the fine adjustment, that's for focusing. So that's what I mean by functions. Know their parts and their functions. 
So please spend time reviewing page 18 and 19, the parts of the compound light microscope. Sierra? It's not matching, it's multiple choice. That's a good question. Every question on your lab test is multiple choice. So I'm just making this up. Let's say I tag uh, with a sticker the ocular. Um, again, I'm making this up. For question 28, I put a 28 on the ocular, and the questions say, what's the name of this part? And you have to pick ocular. Okay, or the question might say, what's the function of this part? And you have to say magnification. Everybody okay with that? Okay, great. Okay, know how to use the compound light microscope on low and high power. Okay, so first of all, on a compound light microscope, there's three objectives that we use. If you don't remember them, turn to page 21, and they're in table 2.3. There's the scanning objective, the low power objective, and the high power objective. Um, no matter what, which one do you always start with? Scanning. scanning. And then you find what you want and focus it, and then you center it in the middle of your field of view. I just reminded you what a field of view was up here. It's the circle of white light. Then you go to 10x and find it again, center and focus, and then you go to high power. When you get to high power, can you use the coarse and the fine adjustment? No. What can you use? The fine only. On high power, all you can use is the fine adjustment. When you're using a light microscope, should you be adjusting the light? Yes. yes. Too much light and you don't see any details. Not enough light, you don't see anything. So yes, you've got to constantly be adjusting the light as you're moving through the objectives and looking through the microscope. Okay, you have to be able to calculate total magnification. Still on page 21, table 2.3, we calculated total magnification. Can anybody come up with the calculation equation that we should use? You do the ocular magnification times the objective magnification to equal the magnification. Thank you, Jess. Ocular magnification, which you can find on the ocular, and then look to see which objective is clicked into position, find the magnification on it, and then multiply the two together. How do you know which numbers on a microscope are magnifications? Because there's all kinds of numbers on a microscope. How do you know which ones are the magnifications? They have X's. So there'll be a number with an X. So you don't have to memorize them. You just have to find them on the scope and know to multiply. But okay, on total magnification. Okay, so the, um, well, Kelly, there's a microscope right behind you. If you turn the other way. Could you see which objective is clicked into position there? 40. And then how would you find the ocular? Magnification. Why don't you go look and see? Remember, we're looking for numbers with, with X's on them. I don't want to lie and say it's always 10. For every scope in this room, it's 10. So, um, Clarissa. Would you point out the magnification of the ocular to Kelly because she's not seeing the correct number? Kelly, go look. On the ocular. The ocular refers to where your eye goes. There's an X past the 55? No. Looking for a number with an X.
I know you guys found it one day because we all did it together. I know it's on that scope. So what is it? Ten. Okay, so the ocular is ten. And then Kelly said the 40 is clicked into position. So on the test, what will you pick? For what? For a total magnification. 40? 400. 40 is going to be a choice. 10 is going to be a choice. 50 is going to be a choice. Yeah, you got to know to take the two numbers and do what with them? Multiply them. Uh huh. What's TM stand for? Thank you very much. Okay, we had four objectives on, excuse me, three objectives on page 21 scanning, low power, high power. Which one gives the largest field of view? Scanning. And guys, we even used a ruler and measured it to test that hypothesis, I think it was five millimeters was the field of view on scanning. Did you guys write that down somewhere? Yeah. And then what was it for low power? Two. And what was it for high power? Half. Point five. So scanning definitely has the largest field of view. Okay, back up one page to page 20 and find in the middle of the page the word inversion. What's inverted me? So inversion means that when you view an image through the microscope because of the mirrors of the microscope, the image is now upside down and the image is um, in the left has become the right. That's what I mean by backwards. So just pretend with me. You may remember we did the letter E that day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want you to draw in your notes the letter E inverted. I drew the regular letter E. Now you draw it how it would appear under the microscope. I want you to invert the letter E. Okay, and then check on the person at your table and see if they inverted it the same way you inverted it. Their E should look like your E. They'll check on each other. Okay, does your letter E look like that? This one. No, that's not right. Oh, that one's not right because all I did was flip it right to left. Yeah, Correct? Well. Yeah, I got to go upside down as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the letter E inverted. The tops become the bottom, the lefts become the right. This one's not correct. Right, okay, on inversion. Okay, so why should we care? How does inversion relate to us using a microscope? We have to always know that our image is, is upside down or backwards. Mm -hmm. And so when you move your image to the left, you really have moved it to the right. right. Or when your image looks like it's going up, in reality, you moved it down. down. So movement is opposite when you're using the microscope. And again, it's because of the mirrors. Anybody have a question about exercise two microscopy? All right, exercise three. To get us started, would you join me on page 40 in your laboratory manual? At the top of page 40, I think that you made a table. Page 40. On page 40, what chemical is used to test for protein?
Fire red is correct. And what's a positive color for protein? What's a negative color for protein? You guys have forgotten this stuff. Eric, have you forgotten this? Never knew it in the first place? All right. All right, I need to know what chemical you use to test for starch. Iodine, good. What's a positive color? Purple is a positive color. Any others? Yeah, any of the dark colors. I'll, go, I'll take black, navy blue, purple, chocolate brown, any of the dark colors. How about a negative color for starch? Amber. Right, okay, on the test for starch. I'm getting this from page 40. Okay, from page 40, what is used to test for sugar? Good. Benedict's and heat. You do have to heat. Okay, there are many positive colors. What are they? One negative color. What is it? Yes, ma'am. That quiz that we did, mm -hmm. were we uh, tested a uh, grade on that or no? Mm -hmm. So, let me just get a blank page here. Let me see what I don't remember. No, that's not it. I don't remember. I'll just do it here. We'll do this question in a minute, but here was the question is, the quiz and the unknown that we did, how does that count for my grade? So, when you take the test on Thursday, the most that you can make on the test is a 90. Then your unknown, which I'm abbreviating here. Do you guys remember that? I gave you a little tube with a number on it. Do you remember doing that? Yes. That was eight points. And then the quiz that you took, that was two points. Does everybody see what that adds up to? A hundred. So the answer to your question is yes. It's part of lab test one. It's a good question. I'm sorry, I didn't hear anything else. I was thinking. And then the garden's another five bonus? Right. So you could make 105. What if we weren't here today for the... Then, then that's up to you to arrange with me to make it up. But that's between you and me. I'm not going to take the time to do that. But you never emailed me and talked to me about it or anything. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so... Still on page 40, we have one more category to talk about. This was not a chemical. This was brown paper. You guys remember brown paper? Okay, so how do you use brown paper to test for lipid? Well, first you got to put a drop of something on the piece of brown paper, right? And then what did we do with it? Yeah, we got to put it in the microwave. And we put it in the microwave to evaporate the liquid. And then we took the piece of brown paper out and we looked at it. And what were we looking for? Yeah, we were looking for a translucent spot. If we see a translucent spot, that was positive for lipid. Positive for lipid. If you couldn't see the light through it, no translucent spot, that was negative for lipid. Okay, that was all from page 40. Okay, now we're going to back up a little bit and uh, talk about some other specific things associated with that lab. Would you join me on page 28 and 29? I have, what are the building blocks of carbohydrates? You know, what's the basic unit that carbohydrates are built out of? Monosaccharides. Excellent. Monosaccharides. Cameron said monosaccharides. In case you don't know this, mono means one and saccharide means sugar. So this means one sugar. One sugar. So the smallest carbohydrates are these small one unit sugars. Monosaccharides. 
Okay, still on uh, number two, the building blocks of lipids. Now, I have a reference page up here. Would you join me on page 34? I remember this question from our lecture test last week. I think I asked you, what was a fat or oil made out of? And here it is on page 34. What is a lipid made out of? Glycerol and what? Very good. Three fatty acids. And again, that was page 34. Page 34. And then the last part of number two of the first question, number two. What are the building blocks of proteins? Everybody knows this one. Sure. I'm just abbreviating it because everybody knows it. AA amino acids. So in case you wanted a, a reference page for that, that was on page 33. Can you join me on page 33? Because everybody likes amino acids. So everybody likes to look at the chemical reaction where we put one amino acid with another amino acid. Everybody likes that one. And that will take us to the next question. How, if you were going to put amino acids together, what kind of chemical reaction would you be doing? The top of page 33, where I'm taking one amino acid and joining it to another amino acid, what kind of chemical reaction are you doing? Thank you. Who told me that? Good, Jessica. Dehydration. Everybody found where Jessica found that at? Dehydration. Where you're putting one amino acid and linking it to the next amino acid, that's a dehydration reaction. Again, page 33 is a great reference, but any of the chemical reactions in this lab are dehydrations if they're going from left to right. Can you explain that again? Mm -hmm. So you're taking one amino acid, which is a monomer, and linking it to another amino acid, which is a monomer, and making something bigger. Let me show you the same thing again. Look at page 28. Everybody turn to page 28. There's a pattern here. Instead of amino acids, what are we linking together? On page 28. Glucose is not an amino acid. What is it? It's right there on page 28. Nope, glucose is not a polysaccharide. What is it? It's a monosaccharide. Does everybody see where it says monosaccharide? Okay, and so instead of always referencing the specific units like monosaccharides or amino acids, they call the building blocks more generally monomers. Like I could call everybody in here by their name, which I try to do. You know, I can call you Eric, Morgan, Alessandra. But couldn't I just call you student? be kind of rude, but I could just call you student because aren't you a student? So amino acid is a specific name. Monomer is a general name. Is that okay? So this question is written very generally. If you don't like the word monomers, you could use the word building blocks. How are building blocks combined to make bigger molecules? You like it better that way. And so what is the answer? How are building blocks in cells built together to make bigger molecules? Dehydration. It's the same every time. Okay, here's the reverse question. How are the big molecules broken back down into the building blocks? Good. Hydrolysis. Very good. And it's the same every time. It doesn't matter if I'm breaking down a carbohydrate or a protein or a lipid. It's always hydrolysis. It's the same every time.
Oh my goodness, I said this a few minutes ago. Let's see if you were paying attention. What does monosaccharide mean? And I need an example. That's a really good example. Here's one of my favorites. You guys like fructose? Yes. Me too. Big fan of Dr. Pepper. Uh-huh. Look it up. It's loaded with fructose. How is the throwback one where they put the real sugar in? So that takes us to the next one. Very good. What does disaccharide mean? Two sugars. Two sugars. I need an example of a disaccharide. If you don't know one, check out page 28. I think you can find one. Do you guys know the chemical name of table sugar? Apparently not. Sucrose. That's table sugar. That's the one that Cameron and Jess are referencing where you can buy Coca-Cola made with table sugar or Dr. Pepper made with table sugar because back in the day that's what they used to make it with. But it costs more. So they switched this over to fructose. Okay. The one that's in your book is maltose. Find it. Maltose. Y'all find it? <laughs> You'll see the disaccharide maltose. There's a disaccharide maltose. There's another one there. Not as common in our everyday life. Sucrose, I would think, is the most common disaccharide in your everyday life. Okay, and again, what does disaccharide mean? Two sugars. Two sugars. And what kind of chemical reaction do cells use to make disaccharides? Dehydration. Dehydration. Next question, what's a polysaccharide? Many sugars. I'll give you a hint on polysaccharides, page 29. Starch. Now, starch is not my favorite polysaccharide. Because starch breaks down into glucose. Glucose makes me fat and will make me into a diabetic. We just talked about that earlier. Here's my favorite polysaccharide. Cellulose. What's my mama call cellulose? She, yes, she does. Mm -hmm. Okay, one of these I can digest and one of these I cannot. Which, can, which one can I digest? And if I digest starch, what's it break down into? Glucose. Breaks down into glucose. Now, I don't know if you know this. If you feed your body too much glucose, your liver converts that glucose into fat. That's why sugar will make you fat. People get confused because they're on a low-fat diet, but they gain weight. It's because they're eating sugar. Sugar is converted into fat by your body, specifically your liver. Okay, thinking, look, I'm going to give you a hint. Thinking about starch and cellulose. Let's go to question four. What's a common energy storage form of glucose in plants? It's starch. It's how they store their extra glucose to use later for energy. Humans figured this out, and that's why we harvest plant parts that are rich in starch. We harvest potatoes. We harvest corn. We harvest wheat. We harvest rice. Those are all rich in starch. What plant structures store starch? What plant structures store starch? It's so easy you don't know the answer. They're called starch grains. Did you guys see starch grains under the microscope one day? Yes. Me too. What did we make a wet mount out of to seed starch grains? Um. Potato. What must we add to a potato to see starch grains? Okay, so why do people want to eat potatoes? 
Well, they're yummy. Okay. God. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> they really don't taste that great till you do something to them. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just straight up potatoes, not great. And everything you do to a potato to make it great is bad for you. Okay, you fry it, or you add salt, or you add sour cream, or you add butter, or you add cheese, or you add, for God's sakes, bacon. That's all not good for you. I, I don't even have a potato in my house. I'm serious. Mr. Sankey said to me yesterday, I think I'm going to bring home a potato today so I can have a potato with my dinner tonight. I said, knock yourself out. We don't buy potatoes at my house. Mm -mm. Moving on. I'll give you a hint. This is either starch or cellulose. I'm on question number five. What's the structural form of glucose polymers found in plant cells? Not starch. Starch is not structural. It's cellulose. Plants build with cellulose. Structure means you build something with it. Right? Structure means you build with it. Yes? Okay, so what do plants build with cellulose? Cell walls. Excellent. Cell walls. What cell part is composed of cellulose? Cell walls. It's okay. Let's try question six. What term is, uh, is used to describe the bond between two amino acids and a protein? Peptide. Peptide. Was that on our test last week? No, I had a drawing of an amino acid on the test. Did you get it right? Probably not. Okay. Okay, I have what term describes the bond between amino acids and a protein that's a peptide bond? Everybody's okay on that one? Uh, page 33 if you want a reference on that one. Page 33. Okay, now I want to go to fats and specifically page 36. So one day we did two test tubes. In the first test tube on page 36, we put oil and water. In the second test tube, we put oil and bile, B-I-L-E. Kind of like my drawing up here. And then, remember, we picked it up and we shook them. And I told you, you're going to have to be able to tell which one is oil and water and which one is oil and bile. How are you going to know? Okay. So when you shake the oil and the water, is the oil and the water going to mix? No. no. Okay, how about the oil and the bile? What's going to happen there? It's going to make little bubbles of oil. And I think you may have written some stuff down. I don't know. On page 36, did you write down any conclusions or observations there? Did you going to see the oil break into maybe little oil droplets, little oil fragments in the bile? Because the bile is an emulsifier. The test tubes on the test will have tops on them so that when you shake them, you don't have to worry that they'll spill. So you can pick them up and shake them and then look at them and see what's going on, okay? Feel free to pick them up and shake them, just like in lab. Okay, on page 37, I had adipose tissue. Now, I did a really bad drawing here of adipose tissue, and there's a better picture on page 37 of what actual adipose looks like. And frankly, it looks like bubbles. Bubbles full of what? Fat. Those are living cells. They're for fat storage. So be able to recognize adipose under the microscope. Now, a little bit more about adipose. On page 37, I hope you wrote down three functions of adipose. Can you help me out? Store energy, because ener fat's full of energy. What else? Insulate. Insulate. It's a great insulator. 
What else? It's real cushiony, so it's great for protection. So three major functions of adipose tissue in your body. Okay, so count that. Last question about adipose. Where is it in your body? It's right under your skin. A lot of it is under your skin. And then in some place, it's around your organs. Um, some of you have done dissections of mammals, and you know that we put a lot of adipose around our kidneys to protect our kidneys. It's a lot of adipose behind our eyes to protect our eyes, cushion our eyes. Anybody need anything repeated on exercise three? Super. Page 40, please. So on our lab about cell structure, every wet mount you and I made will be on the test. Every wet mount will be on the test. Somewhere on the test is every wet mount. So that means you're going to see the cyanobacteria that you sketched on page 40. You're going to see human cheek cells, page 46. You're going to see the aquatic plant known as a lodia. Remember you pinched a little leaf off, made a wet mount of that one. You're going to see onion cells, and you're going to see potato cells. Every wet mount will be there. I just want to give you a heads up on that. On the other hand, no wet mounts will be there that we didn't make. I'm not going to make some wet mount that you've never seen before. I'm going to use all the same materials that you used. So nothing will be there you haven't seen. Okay? All right, great. On cell structure, how do you know if a cell is prokaryotic or eukaryotic? That's right. So if there's no nucleus, let's say I view it under the microscope, there's no nucleus, what would that be? Prokaryotic. If I see a nucleus, then I've got a eukaryotic cell. Well, it's pretty easy. You just have to know what the words mean. Prokaryotic means you don't have a nucleus. All right, I want four things all cells have in common. Who told me that? Alessandra, that's good. Plasma membrane. We were talking about that in detail today. The plasma membrane. What else? RNA. What else? Ribosomes. What else? DNA. Is this being S? I think we made this list our first day together, didn't we? This says plasma membrane, RNA, ribosomes, DNA. Okay, page 44 was this picture of an animal cell. Man, that thing was on the test last week. I remember. Were you happy about that? Me too. You did all right on it. Can you find two things on this animal cell that you would not find in a plant cell? Looking for two structures animal cells have, plant cells don't. Lysosomes, that's a good one. What else? Starts with a C. They're called centrioles. Centrioles. We don't even know what centrioles do, but we do know that plant cells don't have them. Animals do. They're always a pair like that. Can you tell from the picture there's two of them? And they're perpendicular to each other. They always hang out together like that, too. Okay, the plant cells on page 45. Can you think of three things a plant cell has that an animal cell doesn't?
But okay, on those three things, plant cells have, animal cells don't. So we're making a list of what plant cells have, animal cells don't. That means plants and animals have mitochondria. Plants and animals have smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Plants and animals have rough endoplasmic reticulum. These are just what they have that are different. Okay, you count what I made a list of here? Okay, super. Okay, I think we're ready to go to the back. Okay, I'm going to defer question number one to your lecture notes because we did question number one in lecture today. Remember we talked about diffusion osmosis and active transport? Yeah, we did that. Okay, here's an easy question. If you know what auger is, does anybody know what auger is? A-G-A-R? Kara? Petri dishes? Okay. So here's, a, she said kind of spongy stuff. I want you to think of auger as biology jello. That's how I think of it. It's a semi-solid. That's what Kara's referencing, yeah. So we put it in petri dishes and we grow microbes on it. And the micro lab is the one just right across the hall, and that's what we do. But you and I are going to use auger in a different way. Um, it's going to be a few weeks, but we're going to use some auger. And that day, I'm going to let you feel the auger because I don't care if it's sterile or not. We're not growing microbes on it. Instead, we're going to put molecules into the auger and then let them move through the auger. Because that's what we're going to do that day. Watch them move through the auger. So molecules can move through auger. So let's go to this question. In which would the diffusion of molecules be faster? If I put a drop of dye in auger or a drop of dye in water? water. Definitely in water. And why? It's less dense. The water's less dense. We talked about that downstairs. Okay, question number three said, review the experiment that you did on page 49. Um, we made a bag and put starch in it, and then we put it in a beaker full of iodine, and we let it sit there for about an hour. And if you remember, the iodine moved into the bag and made the starch turn, I think, purple, but the, the starch didn't move out of the bag. And we all agreed that the iodine was able to move in because of some reason. And I think Kara came up with the reason. What was the reason the iodine could move but the starch couldn't? It was size. Starch was too big. And you earlier today, you told me size matters on diffusion, right? Little things diffuse much more easily than big things. Okay, now I added to this question with just some pretend situations. This is not on your review sheet. I made a pretend situation up here. Pretend that's a beaker full of distilled water, and I made a bag full of molasses. Do you guys know what molasses is? No. Okay, it's like really thick syrup, and if you tasted it, it would taste like syrup that have a little bit of a twang to it. It's kind of like Syrup from Georgia or something. I don't know. Okay, but anyway, it's like syrup. Just think of it as syrup. Thick, thick syrup. You got some syrups loaded with sugar, right? Okay. What's going to happen to the bag if we let this sit for an hour? Water will enter the bag. Yeah. Water's going to enter the bag because you got a high concentration of water in the beaker and a low concentration of water in the bag. So what's this bag going to do? It's going to swell. So what kind of environment did you put this bag in? Hypotonic. This is hypotonic. Doesn't hypotonic environments make things swell? Yeah. Put that bag in a hypotonic environment and it's going to swell. 
If you pulled that bag out and weighed it, it's going to weigh more than it did before. The beginning of the experiment to the end of the experiment is going to gain weight because it gains water. Water weighs. But okay, on that scenario, okay, try this scenario. I'm ready. Go ahead. What's going to happen? Come on. Water leave the bag. Thank you. Water's going to leave the bag. So instead of the bag swelling, what will happen to the bag? Shrivel. It's going to shrivel. What kind of environment is this? This one's hypertonic. Your teacher likes to make you think by giving you new scenarios, okay? That's just how I am, sorry, okay? But okay on my scenarios, super. Okay, number four, considering the function of the contractile vacuole in the genus amoeba, what environment do you predict it lives in? I gave you those three choices. So to talk about it, I drew an amoeba. And I use some uh, abbreviations up here. It's a single-celled organism. It does live in lakes, ponds, and streams. Ditches, you can find it living in ditches. Okay. Um, what do you think N stands for up there? Nucleus. Nucleus. So would this be pro or eukaryotic? It's me, eukaryotic. I showed you guys an amoeba downstairs. It was that very last thing I showed you with that time-lapse photography and the amoeba eating the little cilia, yeah. Okay, what do you think PM stands for up there? My point is no cell wall. It does not have a cell wall. Okay, and then CV stands for contractile vacuole. Now, some people call it a water vacuole. And so let me explain what happens. The amoeba collects extra water from its cytoplasm and puts it into this water vacuole. And when the water vacuole gets too big, it moves to the plasma membrane and spits the water out. Then the amoeba forms another water vacuole, adds water to the water vacuole until the water vacuole gets too big. The water vacuole moves to the plasma membrane and spits the water out. It does exocytosis over and over again with its extra water. So we're going back to the question. Considering the function of the contractile vacuole, what kind of environment do you think amoeba lives in? Hypo. <coughs> it's constantly gaining water from its environment. It collects that water, and then what does it do with it? Spits it out. Now, why does it have to do that? Why can't it constantly gain water? Because it doesn't have a cell wall. So if it didn't get rid of its extra water, what would happen to amoeba? Psh, no more amoeba. So the answer to this question was hypotonic. But okay on the answer to the question. Super. Okay, I wanted to remind you that on page 53, we did potato strips. And I drew them up here for you. One of these potato strips at the end of an hour was flaccid. That's a word from downstairs. What's flaccid mean? Floppy. Yeah, floppy, bendy, limp. Which one's going to be flaccid? The salt water or the no salt water? Yeah, this one's going to be flaccid. It's going to be bendy. How about the one that was in no salt water? How's that one going to feel? Turgid. What's turgid mean? Stiff. The opposite of flaccid. Now, don't care about that. But I do like these sentences. 
I have a target cell would be caused by a blank solution. We have to fill in the blank. Would it be a isotonic solution, a hypotonic solution, or a hypertonic solution would cause a target cell? Hypo. Hypotonic solutions make cells swell and then they get turgid. Okay, how about a flaccid cell? Hyper. Now, on the test, you can pick up the potato strips and move them to figure out which one's which. Everybody okay on that? But there's another way to tell if a cell is target or flaccid, and that's to look at it under the microscope. Look at the bottom of page 52. We sketched some onion cells at the bottom of page 52. Will you be able to tell by looking under the microscope if you have a target or a flaccid cell? If you see an onion cell and the cytoplasm is completely filling the cell, what would that be? Hi, hypo. How about if you can see the cytoplasm has shrunk away from the cell wall? Hyper. Hyper. See, you can tell by looking under the microscope, too. You can tell by picking the plant up and wiggling it, or you could look at the plant under the microscope. Okay, the last thing I want to remind you about are these blood cells on page 51. The blood's going to be on the test. You do, yes, you do have to know what is isotonic to red blood cells. What is isotonic to red blood cells? 0.9%. If you put red blood cells in a hypotonic environment, what will they do? Swell. Swell to what? What's going to happen if they swell? They're going, burst. They're going to burst. Is that going to be a problem if you're a patient? <laughs> That's a big problem. You're going to die. If you don't have any red blood cells, you're going to die, like that second. If you put red blood cells in a hypertonic environment, what will they do? They shrivel. They shrivel. That's good. All right, lastly, pH in cells. <laughs> Bless you. What's an acid? Um, zero to seven. On a pH scale. Okay, an acid is something that gives off a particular ion. You guys may remember hydrogen ions. An acid gives off hydrogen ions. That's why all acids start with H. All the acids, their formulas start with H. H. So if an acid is something that gives off hydrogen ions, what's a base? Takes them in. That's good. Because they're companion terms. Acid goes with base. Now, I think AJ started telling me about the pH scale. So we developed this scale called the pH scale. goes from 0 to 14. What's 7? Neutral. What's below 7? What's above 7? Right? You guys feeling all happy about pH? Okay. It's a buffer. As long as it can, it keeps it constant until it's, you know, used up. It's either giving off hydrogen ions or taking them in as long as it can until it's exhausted. Now, we did a graph. Page 55. Did you do the graph at the bottom of the page? Page 55? Is that a yes? Okay, here. I did it too. 
Which graph is a buffer? B. Everybody agree? Graph B is the buffer? Okay. There's no C. Okay, and last question is, we tested antacids. Darn that Alka-Seltzer. God, it really was frustrating, that Alka-Seltzer. But anyway, what's the function of an antacid? Like Alka-Seltzer or Tums, Rolades, Maalox, what's it for? How about neutralize acid? Can I do that? You guys okay with that? Get rid of acid by neutralizing it? Is that okay? Which one's the best? Alka-Seltzer. I should really get stock in that company. Okay. We're finished. I'm going to meet you guys if you want to join me in the garden at 1.30. So get, make sure you take yourself a break and get some water before you go. I'm going to put this on... Um,